I want to take a minute to introduce you to what I think is one of the most important of the ethical principles that you should take into account when conducting research. I'm going to say right ahead, this is not one that comes from uh, the traditional Western paradigms of research. Instead, what it comes from is indigenous or indigenous paradigms of research. Um, different people will say indigenous, different people will say indigenous. Usually if they say indigenous, the reason they're saying it that way is because they want to indicate that any person can use these, these forms of research. Right. Um, it's not that these are a type of knowledge that is only for indigenous people. Um, obviously, as we know from what we know about uh, Turtle Island indigenous uh, knowledge practices, some of them are only for members of a community. Right. They're internal community knowledge and not meant to be shared with people who don't have the requisite training. Right. But um, the people who've developed the concepts of indigenous research paradigms are like, no, 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 we actually mean this for everybody, right? Or we mean it for indigenous scholars, but non-indigenous scholars may also use it, particularly those doing research in community with indigenous communities. And also, um, you know, we want non-indigenous scholars to recognize this, right? And be able to identify it and work with it. Um, so, there are obviously indigenous people worldwide are not a monolith. Indigenous people in North America are not a monolith, but the scholars who have been working on this issue have been worse working across different uh, communities to kind of get at fundamental philosophical principles, right? Just like the research ethic principles that uh, we have that come from Western philosophy, nobody would argue that all the cultures that have contributed to Western philosophy are identical, but there are sets of arguments that are rooted in shared cultural assumptions, and that becomes the principle of research. Um, and so relational accountability is a ethical principle that is deeply, deeply rooted in uh, indigenous ways of knowing. Um, and so Sean Wilson, whose book Research is Ceremony, which I have misspelled here, and I'm just going to literally fix in front of you so I don't look like an idiot, um, is, this is the chart that he uses. It's very simple. It's a little circle, right? But the point is that ontology, epistemology, methodology, and axiology, which is a slightly fancier way of saying ethics in this context, or principles, right, the principles and axioms that guide you, um, all contribute to each other, right, they're all interrelated, right, and that they all collectively produce a understanding of how you generate knowledge, right, so ontologically and epistemologically, right, uh, indigenous ways of knowing are rooted in relationship, right? Uh, so some of you may have uh, encountered that there is no way in Cree, for instance, to say grandmother. You can only say my grandmother, your grandmother, his grandmother, right? The, the concept of grandmother is determined not by some neutral concept of grandma, grandmother, right? But by a relationship. And in fact, I think if I'm remembering correctly, um, both parties of the relationship use the same word to describe each other, right? And I'm not, I don't remember how the word works, so I'm not gonna try to say it, right? But this idea, or for instance, um, for any of you who know anything about Anishinaabe, right? The language of the people where I am right now, um, that language is is divided not by gender, but by whether something is animate or not, right? That's the relevant grammatical distinction. And so these kinds of things are like different than how Western philosophies have approached this notion of, of how the subject is constituted, right? But then once you get an idea of the constitution of the subject or the nature of reality that says it's characterized by relationships, then the answer is you can only know something through having a relationship with it, right? Um, Robin Kimmerer's work on, uh, on, on indigenous biology, right, is very much about how do you develop a relationship with the plant you are studying, right? How do you share what you're learning from it, right? Um, so because the ontology and epistemology are rooted 
in relationships. Therefore, the methodology, the way you choose what to do, what methods to use, and the axiology, the principles that guide your work, are defined by relational accountability. Relational accountability is a mutual process, right? The researcher is accountable to the researched. The researched is accountable to the researcher, right? We are both accountable to each other. And this is a relationship that goes both ways, right? So whereas a traditional Western paradigm for research can be extractive, right? It thinks sometimes that you go out in the world and you get knowledge and you vacuum it up and then you leave with the knowledge, right? And like, maybe you give things back to people by like, maybe you help out their community with something or like, maybe you think that by sharing what they think you are giving voice to the voiceless or things like that, right? All of those act as if knowledge is something that is passed over. And then once you, the researcher have it, you run away. Right. And that's incomprehensible within a relational paradigm, right? That frames all of this as being about a relationship, right? Um, so having a right relationship, right? Having a good relationship between researcher, the research participants, and the broader community, that's what's really important, right? And that can vary in what it looks like, right? It can vary in how you implement it, but fundamentally, right? More important even than the knowledge you are generating is the maintenance of right relations. And as long as you're maintaining right relations, then you're, you're behaving ethically, right? And so frequently that means that researchers can't come into a situation and dictate everything about what's happening, right? Sometimes they need to be flexible, right? Um, I know a colleague who went with students to a fly-in community, uh, indigenous community to conduct research. And it was shortly after there had been a series of deaths in the community. And um, someone had died in the community the day they arrived. And she described the fact that she and her research team basically paused their research project in order to assist with the work that needed to be done around the death. Right, um, the social work, the caring work, the collective work that needed to be done. And then after that, the people in the community said, okay, you've shown support to us, now we can support you. We will reorganize your time so that you can conduct some of the research you wanted to conduct while you were here. And so that sort of accountability or mutual relationship is really important. Um, this doesn't just exist in a context where you're working with an indigenous community in North America. Um, I work with community groups in the Middle East, particularly in Palestine and in Lebanon. And I think it's really important that I take my cues from them about some of what's important to them. So I ask, what do you need from me? What can I do that's useful? Um, I make sure that when I'm there, I am supporting what they're doing, right? And that if I take things from them, like I ask them, okay, hey, can you do a thing with me that you wouldn't normally be doing? I make sure that I return the favor, right? I mean, it even comes down to, to the things like I make sure I always have gifts in my suitcase, right? Because that's the right thing to do is to give people gifts, right? Um, and it helps maintain a relationship. I always make sure that I'm asking people, what do you need? What can I do for you, right? And you know when you have a good mutual relationship with people when not just does you know the other organization turn in their things on time but they come to you and ask you for things right a group i worked with um and have a great relationship with kind of recently sent me an email to say hey do you want to apply for this grant together and this grant is not something i would have thought of because i was like eh, I, I i saw it and I, was, I can't do that myself and they said we want you to do this with us. And I'm like, oh, if you want me to do this, I can show up and do this, right? And that's a kind of, this is a very basic form of, of relationship, right? And then remaining accountable in the relationship, right? Um, I'm not allowed to disappear on people. That's a jerk move, right? That sort of thing. Um, I even see that with people with whom I participated in research during my dissertation, right? I'm still friends with these people. And a strict positivist would say, but your friendship makes it complicated to do the research you do. And I'm like, sometimes yes, and sometimes no, 
right? Sometimes it facilitates it. And yes, it means I'm not objective, but I didn't believe in objectivity to begin with, right? So again, as a non-positive, it's a little easier for me. So this notion of relational accountability is articulated most strongly from indigenous research paradigms. And it gets its name, right? From thinking about the relational notion of knowledge and of, uh, of, of the world, right? An indigenous paradigm. But something I wanna point out is that absolutely positivist approaches to research can also take into account relational accountability. What I've got here are a set of questions that are on the University of Ottawa Research Ethics Board review forms, right? Um, research ethics boards come at research ethics from a positivist framework, though they've, they've got some flexibility. But even in this highly positivist framework, you still see that they're trying to figure out how to, to be accountable within relationship in a research process. So for instance, they ask if there are supervisory or trust-based relationships between persons conducting recruitment and the participant, right? Are professors trying to force their students to take this survey, right? If they are, then you have to make sure that the risk is lower because, or that people have the option to opt out right? The ability to refuse participation in research is essential for any research process. Um, that's a core guideline for um, traditional positivist, but also non-positivist approaches. We agree on that one. Um, and so supervisory or trust-based relationships could create a power imbalance, right? And so creating a power imbalance might lead to unethical research. Right, so you have to talk about how you're going to deal with potential coercion. Right, will participants be compensated? Right, monetary compensation for research participants is a way of remaining accountable to them. Say, so you gave me something, I gave you something. It reduces it to something a little transactional. Right, not all ethical forms of research require payment of research participants. Um, there's also non-monetary value that can be exchanged, right? Um, but the idea of, of should we pay people for their knowledge, right? That's trying to be, be just in the relationship between people. Um, describing, you know, identifying people, right? If people's, people's information should be confidential or if not confidential, they should know that right? People should have the ability to control how knowledge about them is used, right? Um, I once read a, a really good academic article that said this research was conducted in Midwest City, which is a medium-sized city in the Midwest, and they didn't use the name of the city at all except that the person had gotten her PhD in Minneapolis and now taught at a university in Minneapolis. So I would lay you some money that that city was Minneapolis, right? But, so kind of, I, I, I'm not convinced any great increase in uh, confidentiality was gained through that, right? But this, this concept, right, that we should try to, to, be, to keep the identities of the people in our study confidential, right? Or, we should make sure that we control this so someone's personal information can't be leaked, right? Um, the concept of reviewing a transcript, right? If you're going to quote somebody, let them see what you recorded them as saying and edit it, right? Um, I, from a, from a non-positivist, highly relational approach to research, I let people say, if you want to take something in this and take it out of the record, you can do that. If you want me not to quote something in particular, you can tell me that, right? Um, and then the, the consent process, right? Are there supervisory or trust-based relationships, right? How, look at this last line, please describe and explain the measures taken to ensure that participants do not feel pressure to participate or perceive they may be penalized for choosing not to participate, right? How do you create an environment where the person being researched can say no? Right? The ability to say no is the most basic element of being able to have control over your participation in research. And in order to have a just relationship in the research process, you need to make sure that the people you're talking to can say no. 
So even though relational accountability is a concept that comes from indigenous research and indigenous ways of knowing, we already have the underlying principles for relational respect in the research process within Western research paradigms. And so I think it's worth naming this principle, showing its genealogy in the uh, indigenous paradigm, and then figuring out what it actually means to do research in a relationally accountable way. 